Hey, let it be known that this video is made for educational purposes only. I feel like you should just probably know what sugar does and how it's related to atherosclerosis. Have you ever performed the shoulder tap maneuver? Tapping the unassuming shoulder of someone you're near only to pretend you never touched them as they foolishly look toward the shoulder they were poked on. Oh, and don't let nobody be standing there to take the blame. The joke is 10 times better. Under normal circumstances, this practical joke ain't harming anybody, but Sugar did this maneuver on us. We turned and seen cholesterol standing there innocently, and we're still suffering from blaming cholesterol for tapping us on the shoulder. The problem is the overproduction of that LDL, right? That fat delivering protein. Just, it's sent out by the liver and it drops off fat at these different destinations. Just like an Amazon delivery truck, it's gonna stop at these different homes to drop off the packages. When LDL is overproduced, we can run into the issue of atherosclerosis, right? Which is that buzzword condition that can lead to things like strokes and heart attacks. Now, we can't move forward if LDL don't make a lick of sense to you. You can check out this video down below in the description if you are unsure. Now, fat is packaged and shipped locally by the liver, so we're speaking of what we call an endogenous pathway, meaning originating within the body. The liver is indeed the source of LDL. Dietary cholesterol, the cholesterol that we consume, that we eat, is being originated from outside of the body. Originating from outside of the body means exogenous. So automatically, that should rule out the cholesterol that we consume as the main issue because LDL is an endogenous thing. Now, already that should unlock a bunch of aha moments for us, but it actually gets better. What is acting on the liver to cause that overproduction of LDL. Say it with me, sugar. Let's get into it. The journey starts with sugar and ends with atherosclerosis. There are three molecules along the way that we're gonna run into. Huge Dora the Explorer moment there. Glucose is the first molecule we'll go over. We have to make sure that we all are on the same page of how this works in the body. Glucose is fuel, and it's the preferred fuel of the body. The body can run on other stuff, but if it has glucose, it's gonna use it. Most foods have a percentage of carbohydrates in them or carbs in them. It's gonna be the foods that have the highest percentage of carbs in them that are of particular focus. Because when carbs enter the body, we break them down to make glucose. For example, Oreos. 99% of us have no idea what they are, but 99% of us know that they are sugary and sugar is carbs, so they're gonna provide a ton of glucose. All right, let's, let's adjust something real quick. Microscopic topics are generally trash. The moment you start talking about stuff you can't see with the naked eye, that's when folks hit the dough. Y'all know I'm quick to say, we don't eat molecules, we eat food. In favor of keeping things understandable, I cut out anything unnecessary. That's a staple of no lab code required. You don't need to be a physician to understand some of the mechanisms of the body that you possess. With that being said, these next two molecules, they must be significant, right? Molecule number two, acetyl-CoA. Johnny, what the heck is acetyl-CoA? I'm glad you asked. Don't, don't say it. You. Ain't nobody asked. Ah. Remember how I said that glucose is fuel for the body? Well, it has to be converted to be useful, right? We can't just take gasoline and pour it on a car and expect it to run. It has to go through specific steps to be converted into energy. When glucose enters our body, we take it through a series of a bunch of fancy steps until it's broken down further and further until we have energy. It's super cool. And the specifics of the process are no biggie here. What we're looking at is when we zoom in on one of these steps, we see that glucose was broken down into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is what we call a metabolite, which is just lab coat speak for it's something that came from something. Acetyl-CoA came from glucose. It's glucose's baby. All right, hold on. Wait a minute. Where are we in the body? We are in the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, the little itty bitty powerhouses, the little itty bitty power plants. This is where energy is made. That is where we are. Well, not literally. You're not literally. I don't know where you are. You could be in your, on your couch or bed. I don't but we are actually there, okay. In a regular homeostatic or fairly balanced body, we just got glucose going through the steps to make that energy. It is the overabundance of acetyl-CoA, the metabolite of glucose, that actually drives what we're talking about here. Under conditions of carb excess, acetyl-CoA is directed out of the mitochondria to make fat. Your body loves fat, making and keeping it. And when we say fat, we're talking about the literal fat that's found on the body in the form of triglycerides, right? And then cholesterol, 
triglycerides and cholesterol, the two major forms of fat in the body. The moment our cells make a sufficient amount of energy for our needs, it ain't interested in keeping going. It says, let's hold off here and store some of this potential energy for later in the form of triglycerides, or we can make some cholesterol. Let's say you have a massive log to cut down to make some firewood. Once you got a good fire going to last you the whole night, you're not gonna keep chopping away to add more firewood. That'll be a waste of your logs. You don't wanna waste your logs. So the acetyl-CoA literally exits the mitochondria and says, there's no reason for me to be there. Let's go ahead and convert myself to fat. This third molecule we're gonna go over is recognized as one of the most important and highly regulated molecules within the body. And we're also gonna touch on statins, the drugs we're given to lower cholesterol. And this is also gonna explain why we blend cholesterol in the first place. HMG-CoA reductase. I promise that's the last word you never heard that I'ma throw at you. This is the chief regulating molecule that determines how much cholesterol is being made. When it's stimulated, green lights for cholesterol. When it's inhibited, yellow light, calm down. And as we went over, an abundance of acetyl-CoA is going to stimulate HMG-CoA reductase. But, 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 what else stimulates this molecule? Get ready. Insulin does. Can you tell how geeked up I am to share this with you? For those of us that are unsure of how insulin works, you could check out this video in the description. In short, insulin is triggered when we eat food, and it's triggered a little bit stronger when we eat carbs. And insulin, its job is to basically store fat. Now, pause here. Let's not throw dirt on all of carbs' name. It's probably important to note that they aren't all the same. A plate of Rice is probably gonna do something completely different than a sleeve of Oreos. So what inhibits HMG-CoA reductase? Cholesterol itself. So when there are high levels of cholesterol detected in the body, this molecule is gonna automatically slow the production of cholesterol being made, right? So it's kind of like when a movie theater first opens, there's a bunch of popcorn being made at a high production rate. But as people get their buckets and are sitting and selling down and you detect that people are getting their needs met with the popcorn, you're gonna slow the production down and make a little less. Oh yeah, statins, this is where they come in. The cholesterol lowering drug, they target HMG-CoA reductase and inhibit it. But now we understand that when HMG-CoA reductase is stimulated, it all happens in the liver. It's going to go ahead and pack and ship fat and cholesterol in an LDL particle and send it out. Now, of course, we can get cholesterol from food, but let's measure it up. What's actually likely to have more of an impact on atherosclerosis? Can we really justify saying that the amount of cholesterol we get from a couple of eggs and butter is the main driver behind atherosclerosis? We don't see people walking around with a plate of eggs. We see people walking around with a bag of potato chips. The amount of cholesterol we consume has got to be negligible compared to the amount of cholesterol cholesterol we make through eating too much sugar. Now, with all things, this isn't happening in a vacuum. We have to leave the door open for more possible insight, right? This isn't definitive, but we have to stop vilifying perfectly okay God-given foods just because they possess cholesterol. We blame cholesterol, but now we really know who tapped us on the shoulder. I'm gonna get a box y'all with.